I'm Buddy Gillespie, and uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker and our next topic. Um, as I was taking notes this morning, I noticed a lot of references to data, and uh, I, I wrote a few down because I think it's a great lead-in to what our next speaker is going to share with us. I heard a term called good data, but we're not sure what that really means. I think it you may take it into context that it means let's have something that's useful um, and benefits the patient and the physician, the clinician. I heard accessing data today is like drinking from a, a fire hose. You think about all the data that's out there. We've gone from gigabyte to terabyte to now petabytes of data. Nothing's been deleting, nothing's being deleted off the electronic health record. Uh, so how do we parse out the good data and turn that into beneficial? I heard the term big, get big data to the bedside, so it's useful uh, for the patient and the physician. Uh, but you can't move petabytes to the bedside, so you really need to have tool set that parses the data and titrates it into what is useful and, and beneficial to the patient care in the improvement of outcomes. And we heard the term um, transform, using data to transform the clinical process. And that's one of the biggest struggles right now. And I think, in my opinion, technology has become less of the issue and more of changing the way that we deliver patient care using the good data and making it beneficial. So I'm proud to introduce our next speaker, Brendan Folks. I've known Brenda since, uh, Brendan since his IDX days many years ago. Brendan is the IBM consultant to their global health care um, initiatives. And his focus right now is on data analytics and predictive care models. Uh, he has also worked for IDX, which is now GE, Eclipsus, which is now all scripts, <laughs> and Cerner, which is still Cerner. Uh, so one out of the three hasn't changed, but uh, uh, that's part of the merger and acquisitions in healthcare, which is a whole other story. So I'd like to introduce Brendan. Brendan comes down to us from Boston. And I'm sure he's enjoying our summer-like weather uh, today. <laughs> Sorry we couldn't do better for you. Here's Brendan. Thank you very much. Thank you, buddy. So um, can everyone hear me OK? I usually never had a problem projecting my voice as a child. So at least that's what the nuns told me. Um, so yeah, I, I came to IBM about two years ago because I was tired of working for companies that got acquired by people, I guess. But. Um, <laughs> So really what I'm going to do today, first, again, first off, thank you very much, the board members, everyone. What a great event, the speakers this morning. Um, I've also been taking some notes along the way, and I'm sort of restructuring what I was going to do, but use a little bit of the same content. Um, so what I was going to talk about a little bit today is what we see from an industry perspective, and, and the great story from Dr. Nielsen earlier, I know he had to leave, about working with that individual, that employer, and the capital plan uh, from Jason's company to make change, because a little bit of what I'm going to talk about is some of the unique partnerships we're seeing, uh, a little bit of where IBM fits, and then potentially bringing big data to the bedside, to quote the term that was used earlier today. So um, with that, I mean, a lot of people have seen all these stats. The one that sort of stands out is you know, 90% of the world's data didn't exist two years ago, and then 80% of that is unstructured. And then 80% of that unstructured is then probably useless. Um, so there's a lot of noise out there, and trying to make a use of the data to make it effective is really the most important thing. That's the things that we're working with clients on today. And I'm going to highlight some client stories um, and successes of what people are doing to try to harness this information that's available. Because the data is big. I mean, in healthcare, we've had some form of electronic records. I go back, I was just talking to a gentleman up here. I go back to writing code for when they were still called Columbia, uh, prior to even being called HCA. So the data we have. It's a matter of what do we do with it and how do we make it meaningful. And that's really what we've been working on. Um, the big thing in the shift and really to drive the consumer piece is right here. And I think the, the, the retail mart was really unique. I hadn't heard that story yet about what Capital's doing. Is trying to look at these early intervention opportunities and identify, oops, too far, and identify the risk early on. Because what we want to do is move that cross section. You know, it's basic. It's just a microeconomics chart of supply and demand and move that back to even just to get into early clinical symptoms, where the folks at Capital from this morning, they're trying to move even way on to we get into healthy and low-risk patients 
to keep them there at a lower cost so that they have better outcomes. But the big thing is, is we're all talking about it, that whether it's the ACO, the MSSPs, Capitals Plan, um, whatever they're doing at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts and Wellpoint and Aetna and so forth and so on, there's 1,500 flavors of doing this because that's the nice thing about healthcare standards. They're flexible and you can pick the one you want. <laughs> so in order to do that, it's driving a change in the need in the industry we haven't seen before. And it's really creating a disruptive business model because you still have to keep the lights on in your organizations. You have to get people in the door, out the door, get them healthy, get them stable. Uh, in some cases, use really cool technology like Get Well Networks. I'm not sure where Kristen's sitting. Um, I actually ran a patient experience conference when I was a New England HIMSS board member in 07, maybe. And Get Well Networks was very new then, and they came up and did a presentation, I think with Virtua, not Christiana at the time. And people were blown away by thinking that far in advance about how do we care for the patient. Uh, and if it doesn't slip out, my mom's a nurse, so if I start sounding like one and talking about the patients like it's a nurse, I can't help myself. Uh, and my wife works for Press Ganey. So I'm one of those unique, it's all about the patient in my life, that's I can't help myself. So, but it's creating to take care of patients in these new models, it's very disruptive. You have all these new risks, at-risk contracting, people want to get in it but no one knows how to do it. You start looking at how do we roll out a patient-centered medical home and we have nine of them in Lehigh Valley, and if Dr. Paul Grundy was here, he would have stopped and clapped when you said that earlier. Um, but it's one of those things that, it, the best analogy was uh, uh, Jamie, the CIO at uh, Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. She said it when we were in Norwalk together. It's like changing a tire on the highway and not slowing down below 65. How are we going to do this and educate people the needs and drivers in IT that we've never had before? We we're all going to put in electronic medical records, and that's going to take us to a point because they're very good transactional systems. They get you in, they get you out, they get you paid. The patient safety benefits are huge. There's a communication level that's there. The discharge summary issue, because nine clicks is way too many. Um, the story was always two seconds or too slow uh, when a clinician needs his information. That's the way they need to get it to them. Oh, yeah, but we have to reinvent the way we deliver care, bring in consultants, add more staff. But the other big thing, and this chart looks horrible um, on this projector, but the thing is these are here to stay. These new care models are not going anywhere. These are numbers, and you could actually, if you could see it, um, there's, there's great stats, but they'll go out to everybody via email afterwards. But if you look at the private payers, they're in the game for the patient-centered medical home. And these stats are from the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative uh, that was founded by Dr. Paul Grundy. Um, I know he's done some speaking events here in the area. Like my first week at IBM two years ago, I was with him for two days at Penn State Hershey and was, was blown away. Um, you know, the work that Dr. Nielsen was talking about earlier, I mean, that's a great success. The things going on at Lehigh Valley. Um, if you have an opportunity to go to the annual conference of, of the PCPCC, because that acronym just rolls off your tongue. Thanks, Paul. Um, and get excited about this transformation, this is the thing to go to. I went, I got the privilege of going this year uh, out to Chicago and watched just hundreds and hundreds of primary care docs get excited about what they're doing to deliver this type of care. So the doctors are on board. It's being taught in the medical schools. There's an emphasis now more on primary care versus specialist that's going on, being led by these teams of people. And the payers are backing it. And one of the reasons the payers are backing it is because of people like IBM. So where do we fit in the market? So IBM insures a half a million patients in the United States, third party self-administered. We spend $1.6 billion a year in healthcare on our patients retirees, dependents, employees, and dependents. So we tend to have the ability to throw our weight around uh, when you do things like this, both at a national leadership message to Dr. Paul Grundy, who does work for IBM. Uh, as the founder of the PCPCC, he is the IBM's director of global healthcare transformation. So he travels the world to advocate for patient-centered care. He has a great job, and he loves it. Um, but at the same time, we back it up. We put our money where our mouth is. Last year, we took our benefits out to RFP. So there's a lot of money on the table. You got $1.6 billion spend. When you looked at it, if you weren't involved in a patient-centered medical home pilot, you know, ACO type of a program, you were out. 30,000 IBM patients in Research Triangle Park in North Carolina have a new insurance this year. 
happens to be WellPoint, but they moved from who they had to WellPoint because WellPoint's firmly committed to this. So we're not just talking about it, we're actually backing it up and leading it with our dollars. So this disruptive business model, I like to say, if we're going to be part of the problem, we have to be part of the solution. And that's a little bit of where IBM as a technology company fits in after the fact. And the depth and breadth of what we do in healthcare and the, the research scientists and the things that we're doing in IBM research, and when we have a room full of people, we always have to shamelessly plug Watson whenever possible. Um, but really, the, what were the first phase, and what I'm going to talk about is some of the spin-offs, but the way I think of it is, Watson's like the space program. We're going to the moon because it's hard, not because it's easy. Trying to teach a computer to do you know, diagnostic treatment recommendations, to educate, pay, to provide better information to the clinicians, and no, we will never be replacing clinicians. That is not our mindset. It's just to better enable the data, because I always say, well, you know, I've had this question asked me, a physician raises his hand, you know, is this going to replace physicians that I go look for another job? I said, absolutely. As soon as patients stop lying, um, you'll be all set. <laughs> so really what we're doing, and some of the things I'm going to talk about is, is the spin-off, but, you know, when you look at that space program, how many pieces of things and technology do we have today that were spin-offs of us going to the moon? And, and that's really what we're thinking about, is how I sort of articulate what we're doing with Watson a little bit. So one of the big things, you know, well, that didn't come out, but um, sorry about that. That's what happens. I, IBM, a technology company, I think I have Office 20, like 1995. Um, so really the key is, is here is what this is supposed to say, but it's not that important, is really the information's there, and it's lying dormant, and we're not using it. And I have a, a friend who was a 25-year ED physician in New York City, so he's seen it all. Um, and he talks about before there was medical records. And if someone came in at 2 in the morning, and if, thankfully, maybe if they were in your hospital before, you'd hear this squeaky cart come down the hallway, and there'd be a chart that was about this tall, and this elderly patient with comorbidities, you know, had been a frequent flyer in the hospital all the time. Great. What did you do? You read the top sheet. Close enough. Called it a day. Electronic medical records aren't very different and what the way they deliver clinical decision support back to the bedside. The data's there, but the clinicians, how much time do you have to read a two-year history chart on a patient that has hypertension, heart attack, diabetes, and stage two CKD? You know, it, it, you have all these comorbidities going on, they're seeing eight doctors, the data's, the data's all in there. It's a matter of how can we leverage it and share it and give it back to you. Data-driven insights. You have the knowledge-driven care. You've studied it. It's built into the EMRs, the Walters Chlor, the Zincs, all those order sets, you know. But the problem is, you know, you look at research data, you're talking 14 years from bench to bedside. By the time it's double-blinded, gold-studied, all those things. We just want to give you the data for patients like me. Um, you know, as Dr. Nielsen said earlier, let's find patients like Susie, or someone like Jennifer who does have problems sw swallowing. Um, a lot of times when I give this presentation, I start with my own laptop, I have a picture of the uh, Continental Divide. From two summers ago, I biked over Loveland, Fat, Loveland Pass, 12,000 feet above sea level. It was a 126-mile bike ride in one day over three 10,000-foot peaks. I'm engaged as a patient because I have a father with a heart, heart, heart disease, double valve replacement. His older brother had a heart attack and valve replacement. My mother's on hypertension meds. Her older brother died of a heart attack two years ago, and my older brother's on hypertension meds and no one calls me for a physical. So the data is in there. We, and by the way, oh, we all go to the same place because, you know, like many urban environments, you don't really leave where you grow up ever. Uh, my wife, who's from, family's from the Poconos, loves that. Um, so they have the data. The data's in there. I mean, my brother, my mother, myself, my, we all go to the same corner of this large medical center with this amazing medical record that Lehigh's gonna put in, you know, and it's a wonderful system. I've, now that I don't work for all those other people, I've got to see the Epic system. It's a good system. There's no doubt about it. Um, but the data's not given back to them because they're too busy. 15 minutes, you're in, you're out. We gotta keep the wheels moving. But the data's there. So I'm engaged as a patient because I know what's going on because I work in this industry, so I kind of have to set a good example as I go out and give these talks that I'm engaged in my own care. 
Uh, plus, I like when I come to Pennsylvania to have a yinling or two because you can't get it in Massachusetts, so the biking burns that off. Um, so it's one of those things that the data is there. Let's use it. Let's analyze it. So a good example of this is we worked with the folks at, at Seton Healthcare. Now, they're part of the Ascension system down in Austin. And they had a predictive model for CHF. I don't know if you saw a few weeks ago the Modern Healthcare article was about staffing trends in healthcare. Uh, at the bottom of that list was Austin because Austin is growing like Silicon Valley right now. It's a tech boom down there where Detroit, Rochester, you know, Buffalo, their healthcare staffing rate, their growth of job percentage, a huge chunk of their economy. This is like 1% healthcare job growth down there as opposed to 20 in some of those old manufacturing cities. So they have a problem with a growing population and they're not hiring new people medically. So they have to get a better handle on their readmission. So they had an idea of 113 factors of what's causing CHF readmission. So they started looking at it and they couldn't get anywhere. So they partnered with IBM Research and what we ended up using was the natural language processing that's coming out of Watson. This is one of these things that we didn't wait for the full Watson to come down the road with Memorial Sloan Kettering or WellPoint, but let's use what we already have today and wrap the healthcare annotators around it as we like to call it. So basically, rather than just not understanding that you know, noses run and feet smell, but understand patient symptom diagnosis problem list, left arm, no pain, absence of pain, codify that to make it usable in this predictive modeling. So turn it into ICD-9, ICD-10, LOINC, SNOMED, these type of pieces. But the other thing was the interesting things they found was some of the things that they thought were causing admissions, readmissions, weren't as important as they thought. And, and Joe mentioned it earlier when he was up here, that combination of it's not just the clinical factors, but the social and behavioral factors. Like one of the, the things up here that, you know, that was not structured documentation a lot of the time was the left, and reject, left ventricular ejection fraction percentage. It was always in the pathology report, but it was very rare that it was structured documentation. Turns out that's really not as important to readmission as you would think. It's important to the onset, which I'll talk about in a minute, another predictive model, but it's more about what's find these factors. And the things they found was the social factors, the living arrangements, drug screening, uh, drug use, depression screening. So it actually started changing the way they looked at the data and what they needed to look at. And they settled on 18 major factors. And one of the ones up here, for those of you who can see it and can't see it, the number one most predictive factor in it when we also had the PhD statisticians involved uh, to do this with them, they brought the clinical knowledge, we brought the technology and gave them their data back and they verified it but was the jugular distension, jugular distension, so the vein sticks out of your neck, so you can't really see it in the picture up there. They weren't even capturing a discharge. When they did capture, it was the highest rate of prediction for people that were coming back in within 30 days. So now they captured a discharge. So the clinicians enabled the intervention, we just enabled the data. Um, and a good example was this patient, um, the frequent flyer. We had eight, you know, six, seven visits in eight months. We ran the numbers against it in 98, 96. 90. Every time we predicted in their model that this gentleman was coming back in, and it was mainly because of the lack of emotional support indicator. It was basically what we ended up, a depression problem. He would go back to using drugs instead of following his care plan, and back in he would come. 87% of the cost could have been avoided if we'd given that to the care manager to have an education system and get him into drug therapy or drug treatment programs, get him the support he needs. These type of things uh, are what we're talking about, enabling that data-driven insight to let the clinicians make the right intervention. Now, who do we hand it to? Is it a care manager? Is it a physician? You decide. We're not going to tell you where to put it or determine your workflow. We just want to enable the data and give it back to you. Um, this is, now I, I did have a PhD statistician from a client tell me that this isn't prediction. This is just risk stratification. So I'm, I'm told this is not a predictive model by someone who's got a more advanced degree than I am. So this is a population risk stratification, not prediction. So but when we move to the next topic, we got into more. And this is the idea of marrying the two things together. I forgot to put this this far down. But the next piece is actually predicting before it actually happens. This is not stratification. This is patients like me. This is the comment that Dr. Nielsen made. Patients like me, Brendan, 
with all that family history, it's not a matter of if I have a heart attack, it's a matter of when, and I'm well aware of that, I just deal with it. Um, it's a matter of, if you look at all the factors and all the evidence base, so we worked with the large integrated health delivery system in central Pennsylvania, um, <laughs> in seven years of their cardiac patients and IBM research got together. So they started with the Framingham Heart Score for identifying patients at risk for congestive heart failure, AMI, years in advance. They didn't want to wait six years. They wanted to get into six to 18 months. So they started enhancing the data. They've had the data that's been electronic forever. So they were a great partner to work with. As you can see, they sort of flatlined with where they could go. And what we did is take both the NLP and some of the machine learning algorithms from Watson and create a vector that starts to look at tens of thousands of extra data points, eliminates the noise, and creates a dynamic cohort of patients like me at risk for CHF before it happens. So three, four years worth of data, weak indicator, weak indicator, weak indicator. All of a sudden, when you roll those up, they turn into a strong indicator. We mark them up, and it becomes at risk for CHF. Patients like me, social factors, demographic factors, I've talked to some large uh, systems in New York City that handle different boroughs. And they say this, this model would change by borough. And I, we said absolutely it would because of the factors and the, the dietary and the population you serve, you know, and, and all those things and understanding, you know, the English language from borough to borough. I mean, your population in Brooklyn versus the Bronx versus Midtown, they're not all going to have the same factors. And this model adapts for it on the fly using machine learning because more than you could just drill down using it, you know, a BI tool and start ad hocing and start, it does it all for you, bringing in tens and thousands of vectors. Now, I have other presentations that have all the, all the algorithms and I did study computer science, but I can't read those algorithms. Um, so what we ended up doing, and this is that part of the trust, um, I, I think that comes out of it a little bit, is being able to look at it in, in let me go to this one, is listen, you can look at this particular patient, Sharon Thompson, you can look and say, listen, Mrs. Thompson, you're at risk for a cardiac event, but we're gonna put you on this treatment plan because we know that these patients like you, if you follow your treatment plan, get better. Your risk score goes down, green. You stay in a good, healthy plan, you won't end, end up crashing in RED. You won't end up having to put your family through that, let's get your family engaged, because if you don't, there's a yellow factor. You're not as good, and I didn't have the red. Red's a, you know, generally a mortality event or some type of massive admission, you know, a rush to the hospital because you had a massive AMI. It's enabling it to the caregiver at the right time so that they can also play the role of the healer to steal a Paul Grundyism. This is that poem. We are not going to, I think Gus was saying it, we are not going to replace clinicians. That is not the goal of, of the tools. Um, although Ken Jennings put that, you know, thank you, my electronic overlords at, in the Jeopardy game. Um, that's not the goal. The goal is to just enable the data. It's in your systems. The evidence is there. When we combine it with the evidence from Framingham or, you know, an NYU ED throughput utilization, the Yale cardiac readmission, and it start combining all these additional factors that you weren't thinking about, but you know is the case. I was at a large health system um, a few months ago. And what they did is they took the Yale readmission study and they put it on an iPad app, I iPhone app. And they started documenting the physicians, the cardiac, this is a huge cardiac, cardiac hospital. And I said, well, you know, is that being, you feeding that from your electronic medical records? They're like, nah, that was gonna be way too much work. So they just stop and document. I said, well, how's it working out? They're like, oh, we had a 15% reduction in CHF readmissions in the first, you know, X amount of months. We did it, it's still a brand new project. You know, it's a little bit of, uh, of the point that, that she made from Lehigh. As soon as they rolled in the coaching, they had a great reduction in CHF. That was a very important point from earlier today. Um, I'm looking to see where she's sitting. Sorry if I wanted. There you are. Uh, sorry. But um, I said, so how's that going? They're like, oh, it's great. And there was a pause. And I said, so the score's matching up? Yeah, not so much. Why not? They're like, well, basically when the physicians are like, honestly, when the physicians stop and take an extra 30 seconds to fill out the app, they're running through all this algorithm stuff in their mind, and they're saying, this patient's a train wreck. Let's get them on, and they, they identify them as high risk, and they get them on a care treatment plan, 
more than just process them through. So they can't, they're not backing it up with the data to say that it's right. They're getting great results and that's all that matters, but there's probably a more efficient way to do it. So they're going to keep listening because when I said, they're like, yeah, we can't back that up. You know, we, it doesn't tie to the data. We're getting great results because we're just making the clinicians stop and do what they're going to do anyways. Think and give them, let them process the data. So I said, well, if we process it for you and give them to you, then how many, instead of 15% reduction, we could be talking 25. I mean, we're not going to stop them all. Some people have to be readmitted for their own safety. That's, you're never going to stop all cardiac readmissions. We all know that. So um, the other one, treatment recommendation. For patients like me, there's a cohort of 70, 80, whatever the patients are, these statin drugs work best. You pick the one you want based on this, but all these factors, pick this one, for example. Um, utilization, here's my ED frequent flyer. You can see red in the back, that's ED. And in the middle where you see nothing, those are the specialty, the people who aren't going for foot appointments, eye appointments, your cardiac diabetics, et cetera. Um, and, oh. Okay, and there's another one I didn't put up, but there's another one called Physician Matching. Um, I tend to check the audience first before I put that one up, because um, I did it in a room full of doctors one day, and that was, that, when the, the meeting was going great, and then they saw a physician scorecard. Um, <laughs> and they weren't first on the list. But really the goal is, uh, on that one, that wasn't done, that was done with the folks at, at Kaiser, or Scripps, West Coast. Um, but we, we rolled this all up. The goal is really to find the physician care team, not just the physician, the care team that provides the best output. You might be the best type 1 diabetic doctor, but Dr. Smith is better with type 2 diabetics of this origin, you know, whatever it may be. So your patient should really go over there. It has nothing to do with you being a bad doctor. There's just patients that some care teams, it may be because, you know, I, I was in uh, Puerto Rico a few months ago for a, a meeting, and is it 18% of the people on Medicare are type 2 diabetics? It's an outrageous number. Um, it could be because a practice has Spanish-speaking people. It could be something simple like that. But the thing will start to find those nuances in the data that you didn't know and give them back to the care managers to make those decisions. Um, so really what, we, what we've learned in working with our clinical partners um, is, and if you could see it, you'd understand it, but really is... Uh, <laughs> Using structured data, it just isn't enough. There's so much rich data in those discharge summaries. It's all there. And the care team notes and the progress notes and ambulatory, how much of ambulatory workflow is still dictation driven. The data's in there. It's all there. We just want to harness it and give it back and then let you determine where you want to put it in a workflow. Um, so that, I'm trying to stay on time because I know we have another slot there. So that is a little bit of what IBM's working on in creating population predictive models and risk stratifications to try to use the data you guys are already doing. As you start flowing by and you get the, the, the Pennsylvania eHealth infrastructure up, there would be nothing stopping feeding the model with a larger population set. You know, there's some talks about potentially, you know, the holy grail would be if this algorithm runs against 330 million patients. Well, actually, do you really want it to? Or would you want it to run against your patients in western Pennsylvania because you're going to have a different set of population than patients in eastern Pennsylvania or Florida or Austin, Texas. A little bit different than Wisconsin I talk about when I go to say, you know, the brought input when you were in Wisconsin versus, you know, it's going to affect potentially people's diets here, you know. It's a different care plan that you're taking so, uh, versus Austin. So that's really the one thing we've learned is in by adding additional factors, you can get hockey stick sort of growth in the prediction model. That's that chart that then ramps up. By just adding an additional 50 factors, they had a 10% uptick in their, in their prediction rate. So they were doing good. They were predicting at 60 something, high 65, 68% of people at risk for CHF. When we added, we started to jump up to 75, almost 80% prediction rate. You know, granted, we were working against seven years of data where we know people that did progress in. So, you know, is a working backwards. It's a research project. You know, these are brand new solutions that IBM's bringing to the market as spinoffs of Watson, working with clinical partners. Um, and we can talk about Memorial Sloan Kettering, but really, that's you know, that's the Watson specific, the dynamic case advisor. Um, but I wanted to just stay on time, and we'll go from there. And thank you very much for having me. Uh, I look forward to the rest of the afternoon.